Okay, let's start with prayer, and then we'll go into uh, systematic theology. We are on the covenants, and then we should be able to uh, get into the angels uh, tonight. Let us pray. Father, we are grateful as always for giving us this opportunity to examine your word, and uh, Lord, we're looking at key doctrines as found in Scripture. And so this course on systematic theology is uh, extremely helpful and helps us make distinctions where necessary so that we would not confuse uh, things that are not uh, relevant or for us specifically. And we make differences and distinctions between things like the, uh, your chosen race, which is Israel, and the church. We see the promises for Israel, we see the promises for the church. We see how we operate under the filling ministry of the Spirit. There's a number of things that we're learning thus far from the material that we're using. So I pray that when we discover these truths that we would uh, make application where necessary. We, could, we would communicate these truths to our family, our loved ones, our friends. So that ultimately in the end they would have a greater appreciation for you. And Lord, if we have any sins, again, we can go to you in privacy. We know that we are a royal priest. Because of what was accomplished on the cross, we no longer have to go through any particular person anymore. We are a royal priest by virtue of our faith in Jesus Christ. We now go to you directly. We are uh, privileged to become uh, to be called sons and daughters of the Most High. And so if we have any sins, Lord, we name them to you in the privacy of our hearts, knowing full well that you Forgive us and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. We ask and pray this in Christ's name. Amen. Amen. Okay, we are on page, um, we're on the covenants, biblical covenants. So we won't spend um, exhaustive time, we won't, we won't go through this in an in-depth or detailed manner, but just enough to be able to comment on a few of these um, biblical covenants. Have you heard of biblical covenants before? Like the Adamic covenant, um, the Noahic covenant, uh, the Mosaic covenant. These are some of the things we're gonna look at. So these are important to know so that we can make these distinctions in the scripture. So we're on page 139 if you have your books, and if not, you can just follow along as I read from the book itself. We're looking, we're looking at uh, Schaefer's book, Systematic Theology, or Major Bible Themes. So in the middle of page uh, 139, at least eight biblical covenants are recorded, and they incorporate the most important facts relating to God's plan and purpose in the world. Most of these covenants are in the form of a declaration of divine purpose, which will certainly be fulfilled. In addition to the biblical covenants, theologians have advanced three theological covenants, especially relating to the salvation of man. So we're going to see uh, the first three. Um, these are called theological covenants, and it's a view that's different from my own personal view, but these are things that are be good to, to be exposed to just the same. In defining the eternal purpose of God, theologians have advanced the theory that it is God's central purpose to save the elect, those chosen for salvation from eternity past. And accordingly, they view history as primarily the outworking of God's plan of salvation. So let's go to 140, and let me just kind of briefly touch on these three here. The first one is called COW, or C-O-W, for uh, what's called the Covenant of Works. The Covenant of Works is said to have been made with Adam. And the provision of the covenant was that if Adam obeyed God, he would be rendered secure in his spiritual state and would receive eternal life. Number two, there's what's called... Um, the covenant of redemption, which is the teaching, in which the teaching is advanced that a covenant was made between God the Father 
and God the Son in relation to the salvation of man in eternity past. So in this covenant, the Son of Man undertook uh, to provide the redemption for the salvation of those who believe. And God promised to accept his sacrifice. Uh, the third one, just like I said, we're just covering the, the, the scratching the surface of these. Uh, the third one is called the covenant of grace. It's in regard to the eternal purpose of God in salvation as a covenant of grace. So uh, when you have time, just take a look at these and you can kind of look at uh, what the covenant theologians are adhering to. They believe in one, two, and three. Um, on the bottom of 141, we'll, hit this, we'll just kind of skim uh, through the basic covenants. There are eight. Um, three, that's generally to humanity or mankind, and then the five are geared towards Israel. I think they'll, they'll start to make sense when we look at them as we, we go one at a time. The covenants of God, 141. The covenants of God contained in Scripture fall into two classes. Um, the first is called a conditional, and, those are, and then those that are called unconditional. Right. So the difference between the two is pretty straightforward. If you have a conditional promise, then it's conditioned upon something. Mm -hmm. So if you do this, you get that, right? An unconditional promise depends on the person who is making the promise itself. It doesn't depend on uh, whether or not uh, that person will follow through. It doesn't matter if the person will obey. It, it depends heavily on the one who is making the promise. And the one, as far as when, when we talk about biblical covenants, the one making the promise is God himself. Okay? So, for example, he who believes in me has everlasting life. So, who's making the promise? God. God is making the promise. So, the promise depends on him. If we believe in him, then we get everlasting life. If we live in sin, does the promise, is the promise voided? No. no, the promise isn't voided because the promise depends on the promise maker, not the recipient of the, the, the promise itself. So that's why there's un unconditional promises and conditional promises. So take, for example, John 3.16. Is that a conditional promise or unconditional promise? Conditional. conditional. It is conditional. And what, it's, what is it conditioned upon? Us responding. Those... Yeah, we have to respond in faith. For God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son, that whoever, there's a condition, believes in Him, will not perish, but have everlasting life. So, it's His unconditional love that's being displayed to the world, but the, the promise itself is going to uh, be dependent on the person responding to those principles that are in place. So he gives love in an unconditional way. He's, he's surrendering his son for all of us. That's unconditional love. But the promise is conditioned upon believing in him. Okay? So once we see that there's conditional promises, unconditional promises, then we can start to look at these things and say, okay, is this a conditional promise or an unconditional promise? That will help us as we start to look at certain things in Scripture. Those are some of the questions that we bombard the text with. If you've taken the class on uh, uh, observing the text, what are the questions that we ask the text? Do you remember? Who, what, when, where, when. Who, what, where, when, why? And how does this apply to me? So when you're taking your Bible and you're looking at it, okay, who's in view? Who are the, who are the people in view? It's Jesus and his disciples. Uh, what are they talking about? Where is this? Uh, why is this going on? You know. So when you answer these questions, you're not even using a, a uh, resource at all. You're using the text as a resource. The Bible is the best interpreter of the Bible. So if you can answer those questions and you can confine it to the text itself, that's even better. 
But sometimes you won't be able to get the answer from the immediate context. That's when you consult the rest of the book, the rest of the chapter, or other books of the Bible as well. So an unconditional covenant, while it may include certain human contingencies, is a declaration of the certain purpose of God and the promises of an unconditional covenant will certainly be fulfilled in God's time and in His way. So promises that's originating from God is going to come at His timing, mm -hmm. right? It's not always going to be based on our timing or what we think is going to happen. It all depends on Him. If He's going to allow Israel to walk and spend 40 years in the wilderness because of disobedience, He's not in a hurry, right? But there's a lot of promises that are yet to happen, especially with reference to um, the land. So, um, of the eight biblical covenants, only the Edenic and Mosaic were conditional. And we'll look at this uh, again in the next few pages. It's not nothing exhaustive in these few pages here, but enough to kind of give us, again, the, the gist of it. So of these eight, um, only the Edenic and Mosaic were conditional. However, even under unconditional covenants, there is a conditional element as it applies to certain individuals. Okay? So turn to 142. Let's look at the Edenic. Doesn't the Edenic sound like Eden? Eden. Garden of Eden. All right. There you go. See? The Edenic covenant is a covenant that had taken place between God and the first man. Uh, and it was a conditional covenant with Adam in which life and blessing or death and cursing were made to depend on the faithfulness of Adam. The Edenic covenant included giving Adam the responsibility of being father of the human race, subduing the earth, having dominion over animals, caring for the garden, and not eating of the tree of knowledge of good and evil. Because Adam and Eve failed and disobeyed by eating the forbidden fruit, the penalty of death for disobedience was imposed. Adam and Eve died spiritually immediately and needed to be born again in order to be saved. Later, they also died, what? Physically. Physically. Uh, their sin plunged the whole human race into its pattern of sin and death. So 930 years later, that's about the time that he died. Right? So when they partook of the fruit, by way of review, um, the moment you partake of this fruit, you will die. Dying, you will surely die. How did they die? Spiritually. What are some of the examples? What, what do you remember as far as the, what happened when he partook of the fruit? When they partook of the fruit? Their eyes were open. Their eyes were open, and what's that mean? Very good. They finally good. saw sin. Naked. They saw sin. They, they saw each ashamed. other naked. They were ashamed. Not only that, but remember the remember this. This is I've said this before. When this relationship, what is it called? Second. Yeah, it's severed, but it's this is a vertical relationship with him. If this is severed, then this is going to be impacted. This is a horizontal level. When our relationship with God is affected, then it's going to affect how we treat others on a horizontal level. So if Rena is my enemy, for example, and she's not, but let's just say hypothetically she is, my friendship with her depends on whether or not I'm cooperating with my vertical relationship with God. Right? So, if she is my enemy, what do you think will happen over time as my vertical relationship with God is improving? Will that improve my relationship with her? It should. Yes. It should. Why? <coughs> Yeah, because because the mandate in Scripture is love your enemy. Right? So if this is in place, then everyone on a horizontal level will eventually be affected in a good way. And that's why I've always said before, 
our relationship with Him is the key to the relationships down here. Any relationship on a horizontal level depends on Him and our relationship with Him. So you take a person who is not really consistent with the Word, then if that were me, what would it look like when I see my friend, my enemy, every day at work? Now the, the progress and the momentum might come to a screeching halt. Because I'm no longer being reminded of what God ultimately wants from me. Because now I'm seeing life through my own eyes. And you know, you know what? Look at Rena. Who do you, who does she think she is, huh? Look at her, look at her. She's ignoring you. Look at her. <laughs> right? So all of a sudden we start thinking things because this is this is affected. But the moment my relationship with him is strengthened, then it should influence how I view everybody else. So that ultimately, if, if Rena is not saved, then I'll be in a position over time as I learn to focus on him, that she becomes the recipient of evangelism. And if you're my brother or sister in Christ, then that strengthens our uh, friendship relationship as brothers and sisters in Christ. So notice again, uh, as we talk about the, the things that were affected, so their eyes were open, they hid themselves, remember what used to be, what used to belong to each other, what used to be shared uh, when things were harmonious with who? With him? All of a sudden it's like, hey, 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 turn around, turn around, I'm naked. Don't, don't, don't look, don't look, get, get me that fig leaf. All of a sudden, what used to be normal and normative now is affected big time because of sin. And if there's a riff here, guaranteed there's going to be a riff here in time. It may not be immediate. In this case, it was immediate. So not only was there strain between these two, strain between them and God, what happened when God started to look for them? They hid. They hid. They hid. So now, what is that called? When you hide from someone who is omnipresent. Guilty. You're guilty of something, but now your understanding of Scripture is affected as well. You ever go to church and say, you know what, oh yeah, I know that verse. And you can reel it off. But then there are days where you're just like, oh, I'm, I'm, I'm having, I'm, uh, it's on the tip of my tongue. Well, it could be that when the relationship with God is affected, you're on your own. You're out of fellowship or harmony with God. And so now what you used to, to know without a shadow of a doubt is being affected. One sin had transpired and immediately their understanding of God was affected. It didn't take two years, three years, four years. It happened right there. First they looked at each other, don't look at me, turn around. And all of a sudden, oh my gosh, she's coming. Let's go hide. You can't hide from omniscience. You can't hide from omnipresence. But they attempted to. And their understanding of God was flawed for the very first time. And I think likewise, when we come to church, and if we're out of sync with God, and we are not in harmony with Him, then our understanding of God comes to a halt as well. So when the Word of God is being taught, it's hard to understand it because we're trying to hide from God. And we're hiding from God uh, sometimes, could be, through our actions, our sin. See? So, continuing on, um, Adam and Eve died spiritually immediately and needed to be born again. They were not indwelt with the Spirit, of course. The Adamic covenant was made with man after what? The fall. And you find this in Genesis 3, 16 to 19. This is an unconditional covenant in which God declares to man what his lot in life will be. If you look in the middle, he talks about how included in the covenant is the fact that the serpent used of Satan is cursed. Um, the promise of a redeemer is given, uh, which promise is ultimately fulfilled in Christ. Mm -hmm. 
The place of women is detailed as being subject to multiplied conception, uh, to sorrow and pain in motherhood, and to the headship of man. Remember I pointed out before, and I, I covered this during our, one of our Friday night studies, that um, let's just take a moment and turn to Genesis 3. It makes for an interesting um, Bible study. Uh, Arlene, can you read Genesis 3, um, 15 and 16? Genesis 3, 16 and 17. It's the very first book in the Bible. Genesis 3, 16. <laughs> Just in case. Verse 21, Judges. <laughs> <laughs> to the woman he said, I will greatly multiply your sorrow and your conception. In pain you shall bring forth children. Your desire shall be for your husband, and he shall rule over you. Then to Adam he said, Because you have heeded the voice of your wife, and have eaten from the tree of which I commanded you, saying, You shall not eat of it. Curse is the ground for your sake. In toil you shall eat of it all the days of your life. Actually, it's just a, a Rafi. You know, it's funny. Your desire shall be for your husband. Mm -hmm. Did she, she desire anything else apart from her husband? Mm, that's right. You know, I read something. Mm -hmm. I read someone's um, take on that was that because there was a study about you know um, the wife's submission to mm -hmm. their husband. All of that study. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> they were that, saying that, that, that verse <laughs> <laughs> was actually saying that um, a woman's desire is to to be in control of the husband. That's exactly what That's I said. Exactly what it is. Yeah, you're yeah. you're right. So I wanted to bring that out because okay. Look at it in another way. If we use, if we take the word desire to mean, oh, I want my, I'm desiring after my husband, th that wouldn't be a problem, especially for the man. That's, I think that's normal in a relationship between a husband and, and wife, that the wife or even the husband would desire after his wife or desire after her husband. Um, but notice what it says here. Your desire shall be for your husband and he shall rule over you. Uh, if, this, if this didn't have that, that meaning, God, you know, he wouldn't even mention it. That's right. right? Conversely, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. But exactly. it's being emphasized, so it has that. We look for that meaning, why is it being emphasized? Yeah, why is it there? Why is it being emphasized? And then it closes with, he shall rule over you. So some homes, the woman is very dominant and strong, and, you know, she wears the pants in the house, you know. And some cultures are like that, and it's acceptable in some cultures. But if there's tension and it's just not working out, it's probably because there's a reversal of order here. Because what we see in, um, in Genesis is that some women, it doesn't say all, but some will desire after their husband. They will want to usurp the authority that belongs to the man, and the man will give in. Kind of like Adam, he gave in, didn't mm -hmm. he? Uh, she said, hey, eat this. Yes, honey. <laughs> the woman was deceived. Was the man deceived? No. No, she just listened. He just listened. He said, yes, honey. He willfully disobeyed God. The woman was deceived and she disobeyed God. Mm -hmm. So there's a big difference between the two. One was under deception. One was willful. And this is why the responsibility the, and, and everything falls upon the shoulders of the head of the house. So I, I've, I've mentioned before, especially in our Friday studies, that it's okay to have a woman that's strong and, you know, is good with making decisions. But you have to make it on a corporate level and ultimately it should reside under the leadership of the husband, 
not because he's better than you, but because by design, God said, I'm going to hold your husband accountable. So if you want to help, that's the, that's the ideal. I made the woman, God made the woman to be a helpmate to the man. Not to, you know, it's, it's unlike uh, some interpretations based on uh, the things in the New Testament. Oh, I'm not going to submit to the leadership of my authority. You don't know my husband. That's true. I, I probably don't. But if we start with the basics, we have to go all the way to Genesis and, and do a diagnostic and say, okay, why is the woman so bossy? Why does the woman want to be the boss? Well, oh, guess what? According to Genesis 3, you can see that in some homes, the woman will want to be the boss. So what does a woman have to do who has that kind of difficulty? Well, she has to look at this and say, well, well according to Scripture, I have to submit to the authority of, of my husband. Does it mean you can't make decisions? No. no, not necessarily. Corinne makes a lot of decisions for me. I just say yes or no. But a lot of times she's come up with some great ideas that if she wasn't um, making decisions or helping me, I probably wouldn't be able to make it, you know? So uh, together, when, when a couple is in, in very, comfortable with, very comfortable with their roles and functions mm -hmm. as husband and wife, you can do anything. You can accomplish a lot. But it always has to be subject to the Word of God. Correct. It has nothing to do with, well, you think you're smarter than me? You think you're better than me? It's not an issue of that. So sometimes, you know, post-marriage, and, and there's tension and struggles within the home unit, we have to start with the basics and unpack this because a lot of times there's so much going on that you can't really pinpoint it because he's talking about this, she's talking about that. Do you know what he did? Do you know what she did? Do you know, I can't trust him, I can't trust her. So after all of this is put on the table, we go back to basics. Okay, who's the husband? You, sir? Okay, good. Glad we're clear on that. Who's the wife? You are, ma'am? Okay, good. So they both know that this is the husband, this is the wife. Let's go back to basics and see what God says from the very get-go. Irregardless of how they feel, irregardless of the pain and the issues that have transpired, let's go back to the basics and work from there. It's like I've said before, if you've ever gone to the doctor's office, what do they do? They take you in, Mr. Malari, how are you feeling today? You're in for a stomach ache? Okay. Um, open your mouth. What do they do? They check your temperature. What else do they do? Blood pressure. Blood pressure. What else? They send you a bill. <laughs> they send you a bill. They check your weight. Weight. Right? There's a few things that they do. It's standard. You could have a you could have a wound here. You could be bleeding here, and they're still going to take the same thing, right? So they start with the basics because you have to start with the basics to get a baseline. And once you say, okay, well, um, temperature's up, something's going on. BP is way, way up, so he's probably in a lot of pain. And weight is unusually low for his build or her build. Uh, so he's probably not eating. How, where's all this energy coming from? So then the doctor takes it, he sits on the other side for a minute, reads the profile and says, oh, okay, BP's up, I've got a cut here. Um, weight is extremely low, 20 pounds below norm. Hmm, interesting. And then he goes in and he proceeds. But he has something to work with. And he has years and years of experience to be able to say, okay, I have these three things down, now I should be able to uh, have something to work with. Even before he sees you, right? So likewise, when it comes to the scripture, we see something like this in Genesis 3. Now we know, okay, this is something that the Bible is already communicating. This is one of those readings. And it's important for us to be able to see this. Okay, so, um, man will henceforth earn his bread by, by the sweat of his brow. In other words, from this point on, he's going to earn the bread from the sweat of his brow. He's going to work hard. Man's life will be uh, one of sorrow and ultimate death. So they would now experience physical death. Noahic covenant, 
um, with reference to Noah and his sons. The covenant, while repeating some of the features of the Adamic covenant, introduced a new principle of human government as a means to curb sin. And like the Adamic covenant, it was unconditional and it revealed God's purpose for the race subsequent to Noah. Provisions of the covenant included the establishment of the principle of human government and that capital punish, punishment was provided for those who took away another man's life. The normal order of nature was reaffirmed and man was given permission to what? Eat flesh, Eat flesh of animals. So Genesis 9, uh, 3, 3 and 4 instead of living only on vegetables, as he seems to have done before the flood. So the vegetarian lifestyle seems to be the normative prior to Genesis 9. So, but it's after, around the, in Genesis 9, 3, 4, God gives them permission to eat things that are, let me see, I think it says anything crawling. Um, it says... Every moving thing that lives shall be food for you. I have given you all things, even as the green herbs. But you shall not eat flesh with its life, that is, its blood. Now I know that there's some Filipino dishes with blood, right? Um, but that's not the same thing, and there's, there's more that we can say about that, but that's not a part of this study. <laughs> So that's, that's different. Um, Rina? At this point in history, everyone's a Gentile, right? Yes. Mm -hmm. Good call. Under the Noahic, yes. It's not until you get to the Abrahamic covenant. The next one, actually. Um, the Abrahamic covenant... And this is really, I wish we had more time. As I was reviewing this, I, I was reminded of a number of things here. It's really awesome. In fact, let, let's turn to Genesis 12. Um, now the Lord said to Abram, get out of your country for, from your family and from your father's house to a land that I will show you. I will make you a great nation. Talking to Abraham. Abraham. I will bless you and make your name great, and you shall be a blessing. I will bless those who bless you and curse him who curses you. So that's very, very <clears throat> important. And in all your families of the earth shall be, in, oh, and in you, all the families of the earth shall be blessed. So Abram departed as the Lord had spoken to him, and Lot went with him. And Abram was 75 years old when he departed from Haran. Take a look at uh, 15, chapter 15. I believe this is a, a passage here. Um, That's the one. Give me a moment here. Okay, that's not what I was looking for. Um, anyways, let's just go back to the, the book here. Uh, I'll, I'll try to see if I can remember it before tonight it closes. Uh, one of the greatest revelations um, of God concerning future history and its profound promises were given along three lines. Here are those three lines. One, uh, Abram, Abraham will have numerous posterity or a large future generation of people. He would have personal blessings and his name would be great. great. Okay? So numerous posterity, meaning future generations, 
he would have uh, much personal blessing, Genesis 13 and so on, and his name would be great. Um, and he would personally be a blessing. Second, through Abraham, again we're talking about the Abrahamic covenant, um, the promise was made that a great nation would emerge. Um, a third major area of this covenant was the promise that through Abraham, blessing would come to the entire world, according to uh, the 12th chapter of Genesis. And it says, um, I will bless those who, let's see, that's not it. What's it? I will bless those who bless you. Yeah, I will bless those who bless you, and I will curse him who curses you, oh, in this one, and in you, all the families of the earth shall be blessed. Okay? So a promise that through Abraham, blessing would come to the entire world. This was to be fulfilled, and that Israel was to be the special channel of God's divine revelations. Um, supremely, notice, the blessing to the nations would be provided through who? Abraham. Through Jesus Christ, who would be a descendant of Abraham. And because of Israel's special relationship to God, God pronounced a solemn curse on those who would curse Israel and a blessing upon those who would bless Israel. This is the reason why there's a lot of things going on today where people are very supportive and proactive over Israel. So, you know, they take this verse, and rightfully so, where it says if you are going to, or nobody's cursing Israel, at least not us. Um, but there are people who are cursing Israel and yeah. trying to take what belongs to Israel. Mm -hmm. So God says, uh, God pronounced a solemn curse on those who would curse Israel uh, mm -hmm. and blessing on those who would bless Israel. Genesis 12, 3. The covenant with Abraham, like the Adamic and Noahic, is unconditional. So he's going to fulfill these promises and ultimately it would be to give back the land that ultimately belongs to, to Israel. That's future yet. That hasn't happened yet. Who knows about, who can tell me about the Mosaic Covenant? What's going on with the Mosaic Covenant? That's after Abraham is introduced. All I can tell you is the Mosaic came from the word Moses. <laughs> right? Okay. Right? Yeah. Rafi is so sharp. Oh, man. It's, you're right. Um, notice, the Mosaic Covenant was given through Moses. For who? For the children of Israel. For the children of Israel while they were journeying from Egypt to the Promised Land. God gave to Moses the law which was to govern his relationship to the people of Israel. The approximately 600 specific commands are classified into three major divisions. So when you think of their um, relationship um, and you start thinking about the laws that they were subject to, it breaks down into these three categories. One, the commandments containing the express will of God, thou shall not kill or thou shall not murder, uh, right? Remember the Sabbath, and there's about over 600 commands. Then there are the judgments relating to the social and civil life of Israel. Uh, Exodus 21 to 24 kind of details what that's all about. And then the ordinances, what you have to do for um, religious uh, reasons. The Mosaic Law was a conditional covenant and embodied the principle that if Israel was obedient, God would what? Bless them. He would bless them. But if Israel was disobedient, God would curse them and discipline them. Um, although it was anticipated that Israel would fail, God promised that he would not forsake his people. The Mosaic Covenant was also a temporary one and would terminate at the cross of Christ. And although containing gracious elements, it was basically a covenant of works, good works. 
So if it terminated at the cross, what does that mean? We're not under Mosaic. We're not under the Mosaic law anymore. And in fact, we have never been under the Mosaic law because we're not a part of Israel. Mm -hmm. Yeah. It was written to Israel. Right, Rena? What if you were what if you were a Gentile living like with them? Were you if you were a Gentile living with them? Or like a foreigner. You would be subject to a lot of the laws, including tithing. But tithing is not something for us today. Right? Tithing was a system that was given under the Mosaic Law. Now, I know churches, a lot of churches use it to kind of encourage people to give a minimum of 10%. But when you do, uh, you do some studies on the origin of tithing itself, it's really taxation. And it included believers and unbelievers. So it makes for a good study, Rafi. Oh, that, you did a did you, you, you researched yeah. that too. Right? Yeah, and that taxation is for the nation of Israel. Yes. And keep in mind not every and not every single individual was a believer. Yeah. Not every in, in, in the nation of Israel. Yeah. But you had to do it anyway, right? They had to, yeah, do, it they had to do it anyway. Yeah. So which is far different from what why we would tithe today. Uh, if, if your church says that you have to tithe, it's usually directed towards believers and members of the church. Mm -hmm. But if we were tithing back then, then everybody is mandated to tithe, mm -hmm. including unbelievers. See, So that's why it makes for an interesting study, because as I was telling uh, someone the, a few weeks ago, that um, if you want to tithe, then I, I think you know, what you're saying is you you want to give 10%. But that's perfectly fine. It's a personal decision we all make on our own. Um, but we're not mandated to tithe because when you get to the New, Ten New, the New Testament, it's now all about um, what a man sows, he reaps. So if, a, if you can give half a penny, and that's, you know, everything to you, and he, he knows your, what, what you're going through, then you give more than the person who gave a lot, right? Sure. There's examples of that in the, mm -hmm. in the gospel accounts. So it's not, we don't have to impress God with the amount because he owns it all. Mm -hmm. But if anything, it's whatever we give, we, God loves a cheerful giver. Cheerful giver. That's the key here for, for us in the church age now. Mm -hmm. So if you give a dollar cheerfully and that's what you can afford, that's what you're capable of doing, then that pleases him, because God loves a cheerful giver. Whereas if you're giving a little more because you feel like you have to, are you cheerful then? No. Oh, God, I can't believe it's Sunday already. <sighs> Is that cheerful? Mm. You might as well keep it, right? So, um, yeah. Uh, and then there are several more that you can see here. The Palestinian that's referring to the land that will ultimately go back to them. The Davidic covenant, and it talks ultimately about Christ ruling during the millennial kingdom. Um, these, uh, and then the new covenant um, on page 146. So I would encourage you to spend a little time, when you have time, to, to look at this, because although it's um, in the Old Testament primarily, it's, it makes, uh, it's, it's good stuff to, to read and to be familiar with so you can make those distinctions, because the things that relate to Israel are not things that we're supposed to live out now. It's not something that we should be doing now. <coughs> Remember, um, when they would commit a sin, or if there was a crime committed, let's say, let's, um, Arlene, you have children, right? If you have, a, let's say you're, you have a, you have a, how many kids do you have? One? Your daughter? Okay. So if your daughter was disobedient, and we're living during the time of Israel, or during the ancient world, and you're just fed up with, with your daughter, what, what would happen if you report her to the authorities? Do you remember? You'll stone Does her to death. Yeah. Take her and stone her to death. <coughs> you guys want to be living under the law? Hmm. 
See, if, we, if we're going to stick, if we're going to abide by the law, we're going to abide by the commandments, then we might as well start taking animals and slaughtering them. We might as well warn our kids in advance that if you, if you, if you mess up, I'm going to report you. Right? But even if you did today, it's not going to be the same. It's, it's to no effect. Rafi? Now, if we stand back and gather as, as, a, as a class here mm -hmm. and ask ourselves, why do we need to know these covenants? Yeah. My response to that, when somebody would preach something or tell me something that defies mm -hmm. what these covenants are, then you'll know what to do. Then I would, I would know what to do. Yeah. Yeah. First, I would not listen. Yeah. Second, if they can be corrected, great. They can be taught, great. Yeah, that's right. Because they, they can take this and apply it, I mean, and, and interpret it so, so, so weird that it's almost like, I, I don't know, it's, yeah. I, I've seen a few of these. I totally agree. You, you have to be, in fact, we're supposed to study and show ourselves and prove, rightly dividing the word of truth. You, you, you want to know what applies to you, you want to know what's <clears throat> historical, you want to know how God has worked in the past. There's nothing wrong with any of Scripture. All Scripture is God breathed. It's profitable for doctrine, correction, reproof. But as far as application wise, uh, for the church age believer, there's a lot of things that are found and to be found in the New Testament alone that requires a great deal of time to, 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 to unpack as you study it, right? So we, are, we have the privilege of God himself empowering us through the agency of God the Holy Spirit. Um, our, the resources that we have available to us <clears throat> is far different from the resources that they had available to them. So back then, they can visually see God at night and during the day. We can't, but we have God living in us and through us. He's flexing His omnipotence through us as we walk by means of the Spirit. So there's advantages. Each, you know, Israel had uh, some things that we didn't have today. We don't have today, uh, but we have some things that they don't have, and they never had back then. So because we're unique and distinct, it would make sense to focus in on the things that God had specifically designed for us to use. So as far as the Old Testament, it makes for you know, a better understanding of God, how God operates, His consistency, how grace is spelled out even in the Old Testament, how if we upset God, it's possible for Him to destroy and flood the world. So when we put it all together, we, we walk away, and, and it apexes at the New Testament, we walk away with a better understanding of God and a greater appreciation for Him. See? So I, I'm not in any way suggesting that you, you don't even uh, read the Covenants or the Old Testament, but that's why I said read it, right? Uh, it, would, it would do you good to kind of look at it so that, as Rafi had mentioned earlier, if someone were to teach something that goes contrary to this, at least you're armed with the basic information where you can say, well, you know, I, I appreciate what you said, but the truth is, I, I, from my understanding, based on my research, I, I understand it to mean this. Then you can have Bible study together. <coughs> Not to combat or to, to be combative, but to, because you're responsible and accountable for yourself, right? You rise, we all rise and fall before the Master. So when you, if, if something should happen, and let's just say the pastor was giving you false doctrine and you never came to faith, um, and you stand before God, and he says, well, why should I let you in? And you say, well, because I cast demons out, I do signs and wonders, I use your name. And he says, well, that you didn't make it. And then you say, well, I didn't know. My pastor didn't teach me. My pastor didn't point this out to me. And God is going to say, well, you're ultimately responsible for yourself. The Bible was not given just to your pastor. The Bible was given to each and every one of you. So don't shift the blame on him. You're responsible for the intake of his word. He's ultimately, yeah, his, his call is to instruct. But he's doing that one, once a week, twice a week, three times a week. But what about you during the week, during the weekend? You're responsible of taking it in for yourself. It's not his job. It's our job, collectively, to consistently know him.
So let's look at chapter 22. Um, angels. What do you know about angels? Oh, there's good ones and bad ones. There's with good wings. ones. With there's wings. good ones <laughs> with wings. They're invisible. Well, I wear one of wings. Um, some are married to angels, I think, right? No. They are made by God. They're made by God. Only What's male. Only, only male. male. <clears throat> but of course, uh, in the TV show, What's that touched by an angel? Yeah, was she a woman? They're all women, they're beautiful, right? But they're all masculine in the Bible. Yeah. And how many names are found in the Bible? Two. 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 Yeah, Michael and Gabriel. So what's that say about the names and advancing uh, Mark? What about no. Lucifer? How about Lucifer? Lucifer is uh, definitely a fallen, a fallen angel. angel. Right. Um, he is Satan. So we can add him as an angel. He was the yeah. most powerful and most influential. We know that he was so smart that he was able to convince a third of the angels to follow him. That's pretty good. <clears throat> there was tension in heaven, and then he walks away and he says, fine. Come on, guys. You guys with me or not? Some of them withheld and said, no, I'm staying with the Lord. And then a third of the angels in heaven said, we're with you. So whatever had transpired up there, he was crafty enough to get a third of the angels to come here. Mm -hmm. Ultimately, to wind up in the lake of fire. You remember, um, you know, the argument in James is... Um, Oh, you do well, you believe. Faith without works is dead. Even the demons believe. Remember that verse? Mm -hmm. What do the demons do when they think of God, according to James? <clears throat> they quiver. They tremble. Right? They tremble. Mm -hmm. So, the only thing in James, it's not really a, a salvation verse, because James is just saying, well, you do well, you believe that God is one, you do well. Even the demons believe that. And when they do, they at least tremble. Probably. They believe that. You do diagram it, you know, yeah. you diagram the sentence yeah. that that is referring to God is one. Yeah. Monotheism. Monotheism, so, yeah. So the point in James was that, okay, they believe that God is one, so you've got good doctrine. Well, what are you doing with that good doctrine? Remember prior to that, if someone comes to you and knocks on the door and says, hey, we're hungry, we don't have clothing, and you say, well, well let, I'll pray for you. I'm in the mm -hmm. middle of dinner right now. I, I know you're, you're, you must be cold, but can you come back later? Because I'm, I'm just in the middle of dinner. <laughs> and he says, faith without works is useless. Yeah. You know all this doctrine, and you can, you can quote scripture, but here's an opportunity to apply the doctrine that you've studied. And now you're going to say, uh, be warm and be filled. You know, well, can we talk later? I'm in the middle of, uh, I'm, you know, the, the roast is on and I just, I'll talk to you later. Right? So James is saying, you, that's a shame. You have all this doctrine. What good is it to have faith or doctrine without works? And you believe that God is one. You do well. You're talking theology. But when the demons believe the same thing you do, at least they tremble. They're doing something. You don't. You don't. Mm -hmm. So that's the point there. That's one of the arguments there is the demons shudder. Mm -hmm. You don't even shudder. <laughs> You're more concerned about your dinner. See? So, uh, yeah, the angels, um, actually there's a lot of, you know, lately, the last 15 years, there's a lot of talk and studies and Bible studies on angels lately. You know, the last 15 years or so, people have taken a an interest in angels. As I've said before, I know I shared it uh, here in one of these classes, there were several ladies that were going towards, uh, I think, uh, Nevada or Arizona, and they heard this squealing, this screeching noise behind them. And there's four ladies in the car, they were going to some kind of uh, women's fellowship or something. They were driving together, and so uh, they stopped, and lo and behold, the, the entire muffler system had dropped. It was dragging on the ground. And so this trucker comes by, 
and he stops, and the girls were a little nervous, but he, he comes in there, uh, ladies, what's the problem? And they said, well, there's a, this thing fell. It's, it's, we, 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 we heard it, and we pulled over, and this whole thing fell. We don't know how to fix it. They said, oh, okay, let me see what I can do. And so he goes under the car, and he was able to, there's a rubber hinge. I guess it just needed to be popped on the hinge so the, the, the muffler system would be supported. So he gets up and he says, ladies, uh, it, you should be okay now. And they're all happy and they said, oh, uh, how much do we owe you? He said, no, 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 just be safe. You know, everything should be good. And they said, oh, thank you. We're going to a women's fellowship. And he said, oh, okay, good. And so he left. And he pulled, in, you know, he left the car and there was a bend. I guess it was just a hill, part of the mountain. <clears throat> he turns the corner, and then I guess from that point on, after the bend, you go down a little bit and it's all stretch, full stretch. Miles and miles. If you've ever driven down that way, you know it's open, right? So the ladies were thanking God, and they said, you know, we should at least help him maybe pay for some of his diesel fuel, his gas. So they said, come on, let's, let's catch up to him. So they take off, and maybe less than a minute they 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 try they turned the corner and they, they they went down like this and it's all open stretch and I said huh where, where's that where's that truck and they said I don't know speed up they were saying speed up and they were speeding and speeding and speeding and they never saw the trucker it's just all open stretch and then they they got a little nervous they said oh my gosh is this is an angel <laughs> and then one of them said oh my gosh did you notice that he went underneath the car and he, he we've been driving for hours and he just picks up the muffler with his hands and just does that he didn't even get burned it's hot. Yeah. yeah it's hot in other words and so they were thanking god did you send an angel were they are you watching over us so they basically said well whatever it is if it, if it was if that was um, an, an occasion where an angel came by to assist then they were very, very grateful. In fact, let me show you something that makes for an interesting study. Um, turn to Hebrews, and then we'll go back to angels. Let me make sure I know I'm finding the right verse here. Uh, I think it's Hebrews, yes, 13. Rafi, can you read 1 and 2, please? Hebrews 1, uh, 13, 1 and 2. Let brotherly love continue. Do not forget to, to entertain strangers, for by doing so, for by so doing, some, some have unwilling, unwittingly entertained angels. Remember? That's it. So notice, don't forget to entertain strangers, for by doing so, some have unwittingly entertained angels. So, um, I haven't done any in-depth research on this verse, but it makes for an interesting, you know, at least it's, it's something to think about. And when you, when you think of all of these people who uh, have reported that they, they think that they were um, involved with an angel, an angel helped them, an angel rescued them, this verse comes to mind. So, but in the future, I'll, uh, I'd like to look into this and see what it's really referring yeah, to. Yeah, I married an angel. <laughs> so just make sure you keep entertaining her. <laughs> so anyways, let's look at the nature of angels. According to scripture, long before the creation of man, God created an innumerable company of beings described as angels. Like men, they have personality, are capable of great intelligence, and moral responsibility. The word angel means messenger, and while referring to a special class of beings, the term is sometimes employed of others who are messengers, such as the angels of the seven churches of Asia, Revelation 2 and 3, who seem to be men, Revelation 1, 2, and so on. And the term is sometimes used of ordinary human messengers, Luke 7, James 2. The term is also used of the spirits of men who have died, but when so used, it should not be concluded that angels are departed spirits of men or that men at death become angels. 
it is rather that the term messenger is a general term. In like manner, the term angel is used of the angel of Jehovah, referring to the appearances of Christ in the Old Testament in the form of an angel as a messenger from God to men. On the top of 52, when not used in reference to men or God himself, the term is used of a distinct order of beings who, like men, have moral responsibility and who are servants of God in the moral sphere. Like men, angels continue forever and are distinct from all created beings. They form a prominent part of God's program for the ages and are mentioned over a hundred times in the Old Testament and even more frequently in the New Testament. So angels are found in Scripture. If you have a Bible and, or an electronic Bible, you can type in the word angel and search and you will find it sprinkled throughout Genesis to Revelation. So the Bible is, the Bible does mention angels, they're messengers, they are angelic beings, they're spiritual beings. Angels apparently were all created simultaneously and were innumerable in number. You find this in Hebrews 2, 22, Revelation 5, 11. They have all the essential elements of personality, including intelligence, moral will, sensibility, or emotion, and accordingly are able to render intelligent worship of God, Psalms 148.2. Their natures do not include bodies, unless they are bodies of a spiritual order. Although they may be seen at times in bodies and appear as men, um, and then they do not experience increase in number through birth, nor do they experience physical death or cessation of existence. Thus, while they are similar to man in personality, they differ from man in many important particulars. So there's, there's similarities, there's some things they think, they reason, they're intelligent, they're smart, they give messages to us, they give messages, good news to Mary and Joseph, remember? So, Rina? So they were created all at one time, and Correct. they're not being continually made. No. no. They're so all the angels that exist, that's it. That's Forever. it. Yeah. That's it. And innumerable, like countless, we don't know how many angels. We don't know. The Bible doesn't describe or give a, a number. So, so they're always there because they don't die, right? They don't die. Okay. Um, wow. If you, like lately, I've been um, reading and talking with someone about the spiritual realm. Um, if you get into angelology and you start looking into what they do and how they help us, um, it wouldn't surprise me if there are some here now. Uh, they're here, they're observing us, they're watching us, they're protecting us. Uh, they protect children, they're there for children, so they, they don't meddle with our business. They're watching over us and so on. But having said that, there's also uh, the, the, uh, the demons as well, the fallen angels that are also around us too. Mm -hmm. So it's not to, to discourage you or scare you if you hear a creak in your basement or <laughs> on your roof. That doesn't mean that there's a demon there. It just means that there's a creek, you know. But um, the truth is, they're around, they're real, and they can manifest themselves. They can, you know, they can do things to, to get our attention, especially to distract us from our focus on Him. A good example would be, you know, these uh, TV shows that are real strong on following the various haunted houses and ghosts, you know, they go around and they, it's funny how they, they, they will go in pitch black, you know, they're, they're going to go into the basement of a huge mansion. They'll have all these electronic gadgets, they're recording themselves, and they're recording any kind of movement or temperature changes, uh, fluctuation in temperature within the room itself, and stay up all night, and when there's a noise of some kind, that's a, hey, did you hear that? Did you hear that? <laughs> yeah, I think I heard that. And so they, they I think they excite themselves sometimes. Mm -hmm. Because remember, they're in pitch darkness. 
They can't see themselves. So when you're in darkness and you hear a noise, then it's very easy to think, okay, that's, that's definitely, you, you, feel that, you feel that? It's really cold here. You know, your mind plays tricks on you. And yet there are some things that are unexplainable. Mm -hmm. And so if it is demonic, I wouldn't, it wouldn't surprise me. But I don't go after those things. I'm not out for a, a thrill because I know they're real. If I look long enough, if I visit long enough and check places out that reportedly has ghosts, which really are demons, then I would probably, you know, scare myself if I'm by myself. But I know that greater is he that's in me than he that's in this world. So, roughly. I call that self-perpetuated hysteria. Yeah. <laughs> but, you know, when, we, when you look at him, yeah, you don't want to get involved with things just to try something different or pick up a pastime because they're real. You know, I have uh, a cousin that was possessed. I've shared this before. You know, she was only nine years old at the time. She was almost 70 pounds, and it took five of my uncles to hold her down. You know, in the Philippines, you when you go and you, you walk into places and you bump into something, you're supposed to say, excuse me. Avi Apple. Yeah, Avi Apple or excuse me. Um, have you heard of that, Liza? Okay. Um, when you bump into something, you say, excuse me, because of the, the little men. The oh, come on, you guys. Well, see, the Philippines and other countries have these stories, yeah. right? Yeah. yeah. Now, if, if these stories, if they're consistently happening, and there's some kind of presence there. To me, it's not a midget. It's not a little man. It's a demon. Mm -hmm. Because it, it lines up with what the scripture says. Okay? But for whatever reason, they were able to get people to believe that they're little it's, men. Yeah. You know? So they continue with that. They enjoy, you know, oh yeah, they're, they're, they think we're little men. They, they're looking down at us, and we're the one looking down at them. Mm -hmm. But nevertheless, I would say that uh, with my cousin, let, let me go back to my cousin, she uh, was brushing her teeth and there was a well in the back, I think, and she wasn't with her parents, so she bumped into the well. And normally she says, excuse me, but this time she didn't. She looked around and said, well, I'm not saying excuse me, my parents aren't here. So she brushed her teeth. And then she spat her Colgate out and you know, went back home. Then she started to get sick in the early afternoon. Mm -hmm. Her eyes were rolling backwards. She got a temperature and then she was growling. And then uh, her mother laid her down and my grandfather was around. And then they noticed that she was starting to say things in English. She never spoke English. There are four languages, uh, four voices coming out. Her tongue was stuck in the roof of her mouth, and then all kinds of vulgar words were coming out, and they knew that wasn't her, because she couldn't even speak English. So long story short, it took my five of my uncles to tie her down, and a man who was walking by said, oh, I know what's going on. You need to bring her to this guy. So they bring her to this guy, and said, well, what are you doing to her? Why are you doing this? She kicked us. She bumped into us. And so whether or not that that story is, uh, in, you know, that story is something that they're going to run with to keep consistent with what they do there in the Philippines. But the guy was able to get this, these four voices out through, you know, telling her to believe in Jesus Christ. Leave her alone in the name of Jesus Christ. And he was trying to, you know, exercise the demons out. So after several hours, it left. And my cousin lives here in the States. She's actually here in Orange County. And she has kids. And when you ask her, if you ask her, hey, what happened to you when you were young? She says, what are you talking about? Well, remember when you were in the Philippines and you bumped into something and then she folds, goes into a fetal position like a little girl and she balls up on the floor and starts crying. She, says, she doesn't remember, but she knows it's terrible. So nobody in the family bothers her about that. Because she just, she can't take it. She blanked out. Mm. So, uh, I do know things happen. I wasn't there to verify anything except all my uncles were. 
and uh, my uncle, it was her, his daughter, and all he said was, four voices? Come on. She wasn't making it up. She, doesn't even, she couldn't even speak English then. Mm -hmm. So there are some things that are unexplainable. So can it happen? Yes, I think it can. What do we do? Well, get into the Word of God. Mm -hmm. Just because these things are happening around us, let's not get sidetracked. Because the real issue is, okay, what's that going to do with my soul? What's that gonna, how's that going to contribute to my stability? How's it going to contribute to my, my ultimately glorifying Him? It won't. It's just distraction. So, Rafi. And, you know, um, people have this penchant for sensationalism and, you know, it's just like spectator sport yeah. for the things yeah. that's unexplainable. It's like, okay. Yeah. And, and people are fascinated by fascinated, the but... supernatural. Yeah. You know, so we as beacons of light, we as Christians, we, we should see that and, and say, okay, when someone is getting um, swept off their feet with these things, mm -hmm. then let's run interference. I mean, we, we can't, you tell, the moment you tell them, don't do that, you know, why are you waiting, you're supposed to be a Christian, guess what they're going to do? They're going to do it more. Mm -hmm. The sin nature of man, from my, based on my studies, you tell someone don't do something, more than likely they'll do it. Ask a kid, don't touch the light socket, you're going to hurt yourself. You turn your back, <laughs> right? Don't partake of the fruit. So the sin nature always rebels against truth. And so ever since I learned that a number of years ago, I don't tell people, do this, do that, because I don't want to give them something that they can react to. So rather than telling them what to do, I expose them to truth, and ultimately it's truth that conforms them and molds them into the likeness of Christ. So that's been my philosophy for a number of years. I've been very, very happy with it. So anyways, let's, going back to the angels, um, on 152, their nature, uh, the unfallen angels, letter B, angels generally fall into two major classifications, the unfallen and the fallen. The unfallen consists of what? A third of the angels. But the, fallen, the, the unfallen angels are up in heaven and some are here. We don't know how many there are. The, the first classification are those who have mentioned remain holy throughout their existence and thus accordingly are called holy angels, Matthew 25, 31. In scripture, generally, when angels are referred to, the unfallen angels are in view. By contrast, fallen angels are those who have not maintained their holiness. Unfallen angels fall into special classes and certain individuals are mentioned. Notice the individuals here. There's two. Michael the archangel is the head of all the holy angels and his name means who is like unto God. Daniel 10, 12, 1 Thessalonians 4, Jude 9, Revelation 12. Number two, Gabriel is one of the principal messengers of God, his name meaning hero of God. He was entrusted with important messages such as those delivered to Daniel, the message of Zacharias, and the message to the Virgin Mary. Uh, behold, you will be with child. With child. Right? Number three, most angels are not given individual names, but are described as elect angels, 1 Timothy 5.21. This introduces the interesting thought that like saved men who are declared to be chosen, the holy angels likewise were divinely appointed. Okay. Number four, the expressions, principalities, and powers seem to be used of all angels, whether fallen or unfallen. There is unceasing warfare between the holy angels and the fallen angels for control of men in history. Like I was saying earlier, there, there's, um, I've been rereading a book that talks about the angelic conflict where there are good angels and bad angels that are warring with each other. It's in the spiritual realm. We cannot see it. We do not know when it's going on, but it exists. It's going on. And so this is the reason why the Bible talks about angels. We have angels, we have uh, children have angels. Then there's fallen angels and there's tension galore going on in the, in the spiritual realm. 
I've read numerous books on um, people who are involved with satanic practices who are now believers, some who are still practicing, and they all agree that uh, there is a real dimension that we just people don't are not uh, aware of. They they think, you know, the, all they have to do is work nine to five, go home, rest, take a break, do the same cycle, the routine, the following day. But there, the angelic conflict goes on on a daily basis. This one book, and I was sharing this with someone not too long ago. <clears throat> they found out that this entire family was Christian, and they said, "You know what?" We need to stop this family from, from advancing the cause of Christ, uh, destroy them. And so they asked for projected, they got out of their bodies, um, and they landed in front of this house, and they said they were greeted by nine foot angels surrounding the house of the Christian family. And they said they tried to penetrate this, they were shoulder to shoulder standing, protecting this Christian home, and they said, I don't even think they even knew we were in the front arguing with their, the angels. And this lady was saying, who, who is now a Christian, okay? She was uh, uh, retelling how she started to question the power of um, Satan himself because she, they could not penetrate through his messengers. They said, if I can't get through the messengers and I'm supposed to be the bride of Satan, what more Jesus Christ? So, I know that there are things that go on in the spiritual realm that we're not aware of. So, just, you know, keep that in the back of your, of your mind. It's not to alarm or frighten anybody, but it, hopefully, if anything, it'll encourage you to be more consistent with the, your intake of this word. Because you'll discover these things. I mean, the Bible doesn't talk about um, an ex-witch becoming a Christian. But the Bible will tell it as it is. A third of the angels are here. They followed Satan. Where did they go? Down here. Mm -hmm. They're down here. So down they're scattered these. all around, and they're probably having fellowship with us right now. Possibly. <laughs> but, you know, greater is he that's in us than he that's in this world. So I, I don't mean to deviate, but because we're talking briefly of angels, that's what demons are, fallen angels. Okay? Mm -hmm. Um, some angels are designated cherubims, living creatures who defend God's holiness from any defilement of sin. That's true. Oh, yes. That was only, cherubims are the ones that's on the mercy seat, right? Mercy seat yeah. of the tabernacle. The tabernacle, yes. Okay. Um, and then there's seraphims too. Uh, cherubims. Uh, angels, some angels, not all, are cherubims, living creatures who defend God's holiness. Uh, on the tabernacle, you'll see two angels covering it. Um, Satan, the head of the fallen angels, was originally created holy for this purpose also. That was one of his primary jobs, to protect the holiness of God. But what was his problem? Pride. He wanted Pro to be like God. Pride, he wanted to be like God. So he had a, kind of a right-hand position. And then he said, hmm... I want to be like that. Imagine having the authority of God himself. And guess what? He kind of got it when he left heaven. Because he, he didn't come here by himself. He was able to take some followers. So he has people subject to him. He got his way. He is kind of like God. And the Bible calls him the God of this age. The God of this age. Third, right? Huh? Third. Third of the angels, yeah. There's a lot of them. Oh, yeah. So, you know, and then uh, the Bible, 2 Corinthians 4.4, 4, the God of this age has placed a veil over the eyes of people, lest they believe. Mark? So, he did, he committed the first sin. Then. That's correct. Very good. So, and so, chronologically, he was the very first person to sin. But the very first human to sin was Eve. See, so there's spirit beings and there's physical beings. So Eve was the first, but we only hear of Adam because, like I said, everything falls on the shoulder of, of, of the man. So even though Eve partook of the fruit, he gets the blame. And so the first 
spiritual being was Lucifer. And he wanted to be like the Most High. And so right now he is kind of like the Most High. Down they're here. Listen, they're yeah, down here. They're <laughs> listening to him. And he even has the title of this, the, God, uh, the God of this age. So he's got it. The only thing is it's, it's temporary, right? Micah. I'm just curious. So since um, he was able to take some of the angels with him, um, as the fallen angels, yes. is, is it possible that that's something that is happening right now with the angels that were left behind with God? Like that some of those could still follow Satan? Um, it doesn't say that in Scripture. I don't think God is going to allow that to happen anymore. Everything is already recorded, so it can't go outside of, of the Word. That's set in stone. So. It's a good question, though. Can they do it now? In fact, the question that sometimes come up is, suppose we're now in the new heaven and the new earth. Are we going to... Is someone going to slip? No. See? And the mm -hmm. answer is no. Mm -hmm. right. So, at least with the one-third fallen angel... At least there's two there. That's a good thing. Yeah, that's right. If you, if you, but see the the power that originates from God Himself, and even if we're counting noses as far as how many angels, God's army is always going to trump anything that. I, I think even if He had a handful of angels, I mean we we read earlier in the first hour how these angels are opening the judgments of God. Mm -hmm. They have awesome power. I mean, just by the trumpet blow mm -hmm. itself, these angels are going to orchestrate mass destruction here on earth. Mm -hmm. We just read, I think, four. Yeah. Yeah. It's huge. Major, major catastrophe. Major, major damage. Mm -hmm. Rafi? No, me and Mark's part of the two-thirds anyways. <laughs> <laughs> Better the two thirds than the one third. Exactly. Christmas party one third. third. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Um, Psalm one thirty one. So some are designated cherubims. Uh, Satan was the head of fallen angels. He was originally created for the purpose. Also, uh, seraphim are mentioned only once in the Bible in Isaiah. They are described as having three pairs of wings apparently have the function of praising God and being God's messengers to earth and are especially concerned with the holiness of God. Number seven, the term angel of Jehovah is found frequently in the Old Testament to refer to appearances of Christ in the form of an angel. Um, the title belongs only to God and is used in connection with the divine manifestation in the earth and therefore it is no way to be included in the angelic hosts. Mm -hmm. So when you see that angel of Jehovah, then it's more than likely refer in reference to Jesus Christ. I, I've seen, I, I've read verses like that in the Old Testament. I can remember we studied it. An angel, and uh, he, he, he would say, you're standing on holy ground. That's yes. Jesus Christ. Yes, yes. So when it's preceded with uh, the angel, or if it's followed with Jehovah, angel of Jehovah, then it, more than likely it's Jesus Christ. It's uh, an early appearance, sometimes called a Christophany, mm -hmm. an early appearance of Jesus Christ. Rina? Um, I just have a couple of questions before we end. Mm -hmm. um, going back to Michael, mm -hmm. what does it mean who is like unto God? Uh, good question. His name unto who God. is like unto God? Um, because it could say who is like God, but it doesn't. It says who is like unto God. Yeah, let, let me see if uh, it shows up in, let me look at one verse that it makes reference to. I haven't really researched the names of these angels, but uh, good question. Let me see. Uh, unto. Daniel, what is it, 10? Mm -hmm. 21. Okay. Um, no, it doesn't say, it just says that, but I will tell you, I will tell you what is noted in the scripture of truth. No one upholds me against these except Michael, nor Prince. Mikael is the word for Michael. Um, well, it, it, it means who is like God. 
His, his name mm -hmm. means who is like God. Pastor Eddie. Yes. Is that why like JW is Christ is Michael? Michael the Archangel? Yes. Yeah. Yes. Mm -hmm. Because of the name Michael, right. which is who is like God. So in other words, Michael is so holy, he's like God. Yes. And, and also just by definition, his, his name. Because in Hebrew, it refers to, I'm reading it here, uh, Michael, the name of, uh, um, where is it? Who is like God? Okay. That's the definition of Michael in Hebrew. Yeah. Maybe, wow. that, maybe that's, and, and you know, maybe that's really uh, more accurate because who is like God rather than unto God. Because Dr. Wolverd was modifying and revising uh, Schaefer's book and he took a lot of the old terms, the terms that he used, and he cleaned it up a little bit with words that we can understand. This might be one of the words that he didn't change. And, oh, okay. Let's see. So, um... Let me see what it reads in the King James. That's my my jab at it. Probably okay. due to the name of uh, the, the meaning of Michael itself. My other question is, what does it mean to defend God's holiness? Uh, to be able to stand for God and make sure it's kind of like defending God. Okay. Like, you know, God is, that's his essence, his holiness. So I think that's just a way of saying that in the throne room of God, those were his protectors. You know, those were the ones who would stand and... Against who? Just as a way of uh, uh, guarding his throne. Okay. Um, his angelic beings, there's no one that's going to, to of course, um, threaten... Um, God in his position, but if you consider what had happened with Lucifer, then you know, it makes sense that he would have someone there by his side. So, we know ultimately God is more powerful than anything, but if he's going to have servants who are subject to his authority, then some of them are going to be very powerful, extremely powerful. And if that's what they're called to do, then That's their responsibility. Do we have time for one more question? Yeah, sure, sure. This is more of a curiosity question because um, since that movie Noah came out, I've been doing a little bit of side study on mm -hmm. Noah. Mm -hmm. But my question is, okay, so there, there's Satan who took a third of the angels and they're called the fallen angels. Correct. The angels who came to earth and lusted after the women and, and married the women and had children with the women, mm -hmm. were they part of that group or did they fall because of what they did? No, they were part of that group because they were part of the fallen. Okay. Yeah. And what were those? The fallen, the fallen angels, the Nephilim. Mm -hmm. The Nephilim. Um, <laughs> those would be the ones that would desire after the woman and do things that are contrary to God's word. See? So the messengers of God that are also here would never violate God and His Word. Mm -hmm. But the ones that would make it a practice and to go against God would be the ones that follow Satan. Mm -hmm. See? So an example of, you know, um, the, the joining of an angelic being and a, a woman can be seen in Goliath. Goliath. You know, Goliath was the man who was uh, mocking Israel, give me someone who can take me on. Uh, when you look at the, the stats and the height of, and the stature of this man, he was over nine foot tall. That's not something we see today. So, but that was after the flood, so angels were still doing that after the flood? Um, no, they weren't doing that after the flood. Well, well, but Goliath was after the flood. Um, chronologically, I think we can we can explain that when we when we adjust the dates. So we'll we'll have to look at the dates there. Probably. Well, they say Goliath was a Nephilim. Yes. Yeah, some have said that. Yeah, for sure. Those are the uh, the sons and daughters of you know the fallen angels. Mm -hmm. But but did they all perish in the flood? Well, um, the. 
Let's go back to that next week. Okay. Research it and tell me what you come up with as far as the timing and the dates. See, now you got the lion. Um, yeah, the Nephilim. Of the Nephilim. Which did not mean So that would be good. Let, let's see what we come up with. Mm. And we'll, we'll address it next week. How, okay. how's, how's that? Since you, you asked the you last question. You opened up the topic. <laughs> <laughs> you can never destroy by Nephilim. So, okay, well, uh, good questions. I'm glad that we can talk about demons and Nephilims and angels, really and recognize that ultimately God is sovereign and He continues to be in control and we have nothing to fear. So, but this is all good information. It's, it's preparing us for, you know, the future. And as we engage in His work, His ministry, we have all this information that we can work with so that we can be prepared for those who have questions. Mm -hmm. We won't have all the answers. We're not supposed to have all the answers. There's only one person who has all the answers. Our, the most, important thing that we are called to do is to advance the cause of Christ. And as we're doing that, we're supposed to grow in the grace and in the knowledge of our Lord and Savior. As we do this and we start to stabilize people through His Word, then it helps the home, it helps the community, it helps the cities, it helps the state, it helps our nation, it helps our world. And then in the end, he's, He gets the glory. So that's the objective. That's the primary objective is to glorify Him. So let's close in a word of prayer, and then I will see you guys next week, lest the rapture happens. <laughs> <laughs> Father, thank you so much for this time where we can study your word. We're grateful for all these things that we're learning based on uh, Dr. Schaefer's work. We're grateful for men who will have uh, done the research for us so that we can piggyback on it and have a better understanding of who you are and what you're going to accomplish in us and through us. We thank you for everyone here. We ask, Lord, that you, you would keep us all safe. And we ask and pray these things in Christ's name. Amen. 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 You know, I learned something tonight.